of organometallics. I see people are slowly moving closer to the front to accommodate my very small handwriting, so <laughs> thank you. Um, so t today's a, a really exciting topic. We'll discuss um, homogeneous hydrogenation, um, the historical context and key developments that have, um, have, have come about over the last 70 years or so, um, some of the mechanistic considerations, and uh, some of the differences between alkene hydrogenation and carbonyl hydrogenation. Uh, we'll talk about developments in asymmetric catalysis and some of the key discoveries there, as well as some synthetic applications. And so this will be a great opportunity where we can put to use all the lessons that we've learned in terms of elementary steps and, 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 and more complicated catalytic cycles. Um, and also think about the lessons from last class about kinetics and, um, and, and how to um, um, uh, think about uh, catalytic processes uh, sort of from a uh, 30,000 foot view and put those, put those to work here today. So before we jump into that, we'll start by um, wrapping up the last problem of the day from last class. So if you remember, last class we ended with a quick discussion of n-heterocyclic carbenes and their importance as ancillary ligands in catalysis. And so if you pull up your um, worksheet from, from last class and go to the bottom, I think there are actually two number threes. Um, so this was number three, part two, or number four. And this question asks you to consider two complexes, two platinum NHC complexes and rationalize the platinum NMR shift. So platinum is a NMR active nucleus. Does everybody have that problem in front of them? Okay, let me write it out. It's a very short question, so it should be no problem. So there are two platinum complexes, one bearing the Simes ligand and one bearing the Imes ligand, otherwise identical. And because platinum and NMR active nucleus, you can actually just take the platinum NMR, and these are the two. Chips that we get, and the question is to rationalize those results and to perhaps in part B design an experiment or two to corroborate the model that you develop in part um, A. Okay, so first. Maybe someone can just help us with the structure of IMES and SIMES. Kai? You don't know. Okay. How about Jess? What? <coughs> the structure of IMES and SIMES and HC ligands. So let's see, a good place to start is the standard core structure. 
Any guesses? Anyone want to jump in? So, so Saga is the so it's the one three five method tail. Yeah, the two okay. So mes refers to mesotel group here, one, three, five. Okay. And then what does the i versus psi mean? So psi-mes is the saturated. Psi-mes is saturated, so I think of it as just s for saturated. I'm not sure if that's what it actually means, but it's a useful mnemonic anyway. And then the i is um, the unsaturated. Okay, so now to the question at hand, based on those two structures, how do we explain the results? Elena. Um, so the one with the double bond is more conjugated. Okay. And that's Okay. So, so yeah. But essentially, the essence of the question is which of these is more um, yes. electron donating, and which has a more shielded or deshielded metal center. And so, your argument is that the um, unsaturated version is a weaker donor, or I think you actually phrased it as a better acceptor, high acceptor. But in general, it's NHCs. Better acceptor, but it's Um, right, so in general, NHCs, the effect of backbonding is pretty minimal. So let's just focus on sigma donating strength. Um, would you expect the saturated or unsaturated to be a stronger sigma donor? Saturated should be a stronger sigma donor, and that um, thus should donate uh, more strongly to the metal center and make for a more electron rich metal center and that you would expect the metal to be um, comparatively shielded in that case. Okay, anybody get anything different or different reasoning? And then how about part B? Let's just um, put this one open to the class and see if anybody has any ideas. No single right answer here. Sure, yeah, so I think that is interesting. If you, can, um, let's assume that these are going to do something catalytically, or not even catalytically, just they have some uh, reactivity, and one thing that you could propose them doing is oxidative addition to any other number of things, let's say an alkyl iodide, and then we could measure the rate, and what would your prediction be that so the more electron rich center would do oxidative addition faster? Okay, more electron rich. Should undergo oxidation faster. Oxidation faster. Okay, I like that. Any other thoughts? Let's get one more. One more idea before we move on. Measure the strands of trans. Okay. So, how would you do that? How do you measure the? Uh, trans influence or trans effect? Just uh, I don't know, make a metal HC complex with a somewhat labile ligand trans to the HC. Okay. And measure the rate of uh, ligand exchange or dissociation. Okay, and which one would you expect to be faster? Uh, if saturated is the better sigma donor, it would uh, lead to a faster rate. Okay. So yeah, that's a good idea. Dongmin suggesting let's make some variant. We can either use this potentially, or if that doesn't work, make a, a, a variant where the chlorides are replaced with more labile groups, and then just run a substitution reaction and, and measure the rate. Faster exchange would be consistent with stronger uh, donicity. Um, another way to do that would be just measure to, to not focus on trans effect, but trans influence, and look at the crystal structures of these, and look at the bond length of the group trans. Okay, those are all great ideas. Another thing that you could do along this vein is to make a CO containing variant and measure the CO stretching frequency. That's something that's been done a lot in this uh, area. Okay, so let's um, put a bow on the phosphine and NHC part and, and jump into hydrogenation. 
So first, I have some general descriptors of homogeneous hydrogenase. So, so th this class uh, today will focus almost exclusively on homogeneous uh, hydrogenation. Obviously, heterogeneous hydrogenation is incredibly important as well. But I think mechanistically, those reactions tend to be even more complex and a little bit harder to understand. And so we'll just focus on um, homogeneous pathways and, and a lot of the insights that I think you can, you can carry with you to thinking about heterogeneous processes as well. Um, the first use of the term homogeneous hydrogenation was from uh, Nolan Kelvin in the um, uh, early 1900s or, or early to mid 1900s. And so remember, historically at this time, there were essentially no known homogeneous catalysts that could compete with the efficiency of heterogeneous catalysis or biocatalysis. So still, the, the, um, the, the way to go in terms of reactivity, not, not, not even selectivity, just reactivity, TON and TOF, uh, was, was heterogeneous catalysis. And so only in the mid-1900s was, was there a systematic effort to really um, get homogeneous catalysis up to the same level of performance. And so, of course, now, after the better part of 70-plus uh, years of dedicated research in this area, we, we know that homogeneous hydrogenation, both in the racemic sense and in the asymmetric sense, is one of the most important processes uh, used in, in small molecule synthesis on, on both large scale and especially, uh, uh, both small scale and especially on large scale in the fine chemical industry, and chem uh, commodity chemical industry, pharmaceutical industry, agrochemical industry, et cetera. Um, and so all I'm going to say about heterogeneous catalysis um, today is, is to highlight some of the, uh, the, the sort of tried and true workhorse systems of heterogeneous catalysis. They're typically going to be palladium, platinum, and mobilized on some solid support, including on, 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 on uh, palladium on carbon. Um, and and, and w one point I'll make here, and if you've ever gone to a lecture by someone from like Johnson Matthew, for example, that specialized in making palladium on carbon, the reactivity can actually vary quite a bit depending on the nature of the carbon support. And so if you have a tough hydrogenation in, 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 in your total synthesis and you try your single batch of palladium on carbon from STREM, well, first make sure that it's fresh. But even if after finding out it's fresh, that, that might not be the right, uh, say, like mesomeric carbon support to, to, to enable reactivity with your complex substrate. So if you get stuck, then I would recommend, um, and, and you really need to get it to work, I'd recommend reaching out to someone at Johnson Matthew and see if you can get a kit to sort of prototype some of their more state-of-the-art uh, uh, designer solid supported systems. They have a lot, and they spend a ton of uh, R&D effort in, in that area. Another common one is um, a platinum oxide atoms catalyst. Um, which, which is, um, I'm sure many people in the group here have worked with. And, and, and so uh, one of the, the points that we'll come to towards the end of class is developments in asymmetric homogeneous catalysis. Uh, this doesn't need much of an introduction, uh, but suffice to say this has been really transformative technology, uh, resulting in Nobel Prize in 2001 for Noyori and Knowles. Um, that was shared with our very own very sharp looks for his work in asymmetric oxidations. And it occurred to me as I was preparing these notes that Knowles, it looks like this last name Knowles, there's a lot of very successful scientists with Knowles. Uh, uh, so, so I don't know what to make of that, but, but they're, not, they're not related. <laughs> okay, so try to keep them straight. Um, and and, and, and one of the things that you can think about in, in, in synthetic planning, um, you know, if you're if you're reading, if like like me, you like to pick up OPRD um, and, and, and sort of occasionally get structures and think about how they're made. Um, a really high percentage percentage of the time, when you see tertiary stereocenters, they're made via hydrogenation. And so um, I think those are when, when you see those in, in, in drug molecules, especially. Those should always be signaling elements for, for thinking about that as your toolkit for making these molecules. Um, and then one um, type of, of process that we'll cover today that's a complement to classical alkene hydrogenation or, or, or transfer hydrogenation processes that are typically uh, reducing uh, more polarized functional groups like carbonyl compounds or imines. Okay, so for the next... Um, 30 to 45 minutes or so, most of what we'll talk about are, are, are sort of classical alkene hydrogenation 
um, uh, methods and, 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 and key developments. And so within this space, there are um, two common classical mechanisms, and they just depend on the order of events. So they both will end up getting to a common intermediate, but how they get there varies depending on the nature of the catalyst. And so one is the so-called hydride mechanism, easy to remember what that means. It just means that first, the first step is oxidative addition to make a metal dihydride. Then you coordinate the alkene. Then from, from here, you probably know what to do. Migratory insertion, CH reductive elimination. And then the other, um, the other order of events can also take place. And these are, are so-called olefin mechanisms. Um, and, and, and these are typically going to involve metal centers that are a little more um, electron poor, a little bit more pyloacidic. And so in these cases, the first step is going to be coordination of the alkene. You're going to have a, plate, uh, a metal alkene intermediate. And then from there, you get um, uh, oxidative addition and, and then similar sequence of events. So now let's talk, let's see how those um, mechanisms manifest itself and some of the historically important uh, catalysts that have been developed. Um, so to, to kick this off, we'll start with um, the chemist of the day. And someone can maybe shout out if they recognize that individual. <laughs> Dong Man. <laughs> He's peer pressure. Succumb to your peer pressure, Dong Man. <laughs> Wilkinson. OK, very good. So uh, Wilkinson's name we've heard before. So he had a uh, long, successful career working on a variety of different topics. He was born in uh, England. I learned that not only does every US state have Springfield, but also perhaps every English-speaking country has a Springfield city. Um, and then, of course, well, what's that? <laughs> Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or any enhanced slip. Okay. <laughs> That's funny. Nobel Prize in 1973, as we learned, shared with Fisher for um, the structure of, of, uh, of, of therosine. Uh, he did his, his work at Harvard and Imperial. One of the giants of, of his era, some of his students include um, um, uh, Al Cotton, for example, and um, Osborne, we'll see in a, in a minute. So his landmark um, work in the mid-1960s, um, which, which led to the uh, complex that we now call Wilkinson's Catalyst, um, is, is really groundbreaking. I mean, I think that just, um, I'm not going to be able to do it justice, but as I said, remember that at, at this time, um, Heterogeneous catalysis really ruled the r r r r ruled the, 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 the day, and so um, you know his 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 insight. And, and it's important to sort of put yourself in that uh, frame of, of reference. So um, you know one of the the, the, the key um, points that they were trying to achieve is to make these metal catalysts, which are, are, are inorganic by by nature and, and and very polarized, to make them more soluble. In organic solvent. So that was one of the big limitations at that time, is that most of the coordination complexes were, were not soluble in the solvents that people like to do organic chemistry in. And so he turned to uh, more uh, lipophilic groups that were still capable of coordinating, and that ultimately led him to triphenylphosphine. Um, 
and, and w which he used to great effect in, in the Wilkinson um, uh, So there are two, so, so this is the structure that we call Wilkinson's catalyst, and there are two routes that can be used to, to access the catalyst. This is sort of the first generation route, um, and then there's a second generation route that's a little bit more modular, and so you can take a very inexpensive um, rhodium chloride um, precursor and just combine it with triphenylphosphine and, and ethanol and how it pops your um, um, beautiful red um, solid. And, and, and so there's some um, redox that's happening. You see that this is rhodium-3, and, and, and the product is rhodium-1. Um, so, so that metal, et cetera, is getting produced, and thus something needs to get oxidized. And in this case, there's triphenylphosphine that's serving as the, um, the sacrificial reductant. And upon aqueous workup, this is just lost as trimethyl phosphate oxide. So this is, is quite robust and, and works with other phosphines besides triphenyl phosphine, but it is limited in terms of working well uh, and, and robustly to, to triaryl phosphine. So to address that, um, and this I think is a will, will become important when we talk about putting other ligands there, including chiral ligands. They have this more they develop this more modular route um, where rhodium. Um, you start at the, the, the oxidation state of rhodium that you want, and then you can just titrate in the amount of ligands that, uh, of, of essentially any phosphine identity here um, and get out the corresponding product. So this is a little bit more steppy, but, but more modular. And so the reactivity trends, and, and, and um, generally speaking, the, the, these, these reactivity trends in terms of rates of, of, of uh, reduction with, with H2 I think hold across different catalysts. Um, so, so some of the most reactive types of alkenes are, are, are cyclic alkenes. These are, are internal alkenes formally, but they're specialized because they're, 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 they're tied back. So um, upon coordination, the metal doesn't see all of the steric bulk of a typical internal um, terminal monosubstituted, 1,1 disubstituted. Um, so, so one of the key points here is that in general, terminal is more reactive than internal, Z internal is more reactive than E internal, and then as you get more substituted, uh, the reaction rates go down, and so when you start thinking about tri-substituted or tetra-substituted alkenes, these are classically thought to be alkenes that don't work that well in the Wilkinson uh, uh, chemistry. And so across this series of, of the compounds I've shown here, there's about a 50-fold rate difference. Uh, and the chemistry um, is, is quite robust. It's highly um, cis-selective. Um, so this, this, I think, will become obvious when you think about the mechanism because it involves stereospecific elemental steps. And then the reactions are typically, in this, um, even in this first generation uh, uh, form, run at ambient pressure and temperature, giving high yields. So there's been a, a just massive amount of mechanistic work done not only on this system, but on a lot of the related systems that we'll talk about. And so in the interest of time, I'm not going to talk about uh, every experiment necessarily, but I'll try to mention a few uh, when it's illustrative of, of some broader point. Um, and then I'll just try to summarize what the, the general understanding of how these, these catalysts work is. And so one of the early observations that was made um, was that there's no H2, D2 scrambling, which means that when you run the reaction um, with a mixture of H2 and D2, you get either H2 products or D2 products. You don't get a mixture of 1H, 1D, and so that tells you that you're, you're, you have a, you're, you're accessing a dihydride intermediate, and that, that from that intermediate, both groups end up getting transferred to a single alkene. And so here's how this catalyst is believed to work. So the catalyst itself um, is actually um, probably more accurately described as a precatalyst. 
Uh, and this, again, will be a common theme that you'll see today. The first step is loss of a phosphine ligand um, to make this coordinatively unsaturated metal center. Does anyone want to quickly take a stab at the electron count of this? 14. 14. Very good. Okay. This is a 14 electron species. First uh, precursor is a, a 16 electron species. And so um, here, um, the, both of these um, complexes actually undergo oxidative addition with H2, but the 14 electron version reacts um, four orders of magnitude faster. And so, in, in principle, this, this pathway could also be operative, but in practice, um, it's, it's a lower energy pathway to lose phosphine, uh, go through this coordinately unsaturated intermediate that then undergoes, of course, coordinates H2 to form sigma complex and then undergoes oxidative addition to make the dihydride. And just to be clear, now we're at rhodium 3 oxidation state. Um, so so I, I'll draw these as open coordination sites. Um, but of course, in practice, you can think that, that you know, a solvent molecule is, is able to bind here and, and, and stabilize it. So even though we refer to it as a 14 electron complex in solution, it could very well be still 16 electron um, some of the time. So uh, this rhodium-3 uh, um, octahedral complex now has a vacant coordination site and, and can bind uh, the alkene. Now you have a syn-specific 1-2 migratory insertion. Um, we, we talked extensively about 1-2 migratory insertion processes. Um, so that takes place. Uh, the regioselectivity here um, is such that, um, that, that where migratory insertion takes place to give the less sterically encumbered primary alkyl metal intermediate, um, which I think we've seen before as well. And then the last step is productive um, elimination. And so I've tried to draw, indicate which steps are believed to be reversible and which are believed to be uh, irreversible here. And some of these intermediates are sufficiently stable that they can be characterized in solution, for example, by NMR. Um, and one of the powerful techniques in, 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 in this area of study is to take advantage of the fact that um, hydride species are typically show up very downfield in the NMR, proton NMR spectrum, so they're often below zero. Uh, and that they have unique coupling constants with cis, uh, trans versus cis phosphine. So that allows you to infer something about the overall geometry of the structure. structure. So like when I was a you know, postdoc and, and uh, with the Grubbs group, I was trying to make all the metathesis catalysts. We didn't ever, we didn't want to make metal hydrides, but those were a, a byproduct we were often um, uh, had, had, had to be aware of and, and keep a lookout for. And so we'd, all, we'd set our proton NMR spectra to scan from 25 to minus 25. Uh, so it really, uh, and, and it took me a couple months before I realized that's how I should do things. So, so I wasted some time. So if you, if you make a transition to more inorganic or organometallic postdoc, then, then you, you learn some of the, the, the tricks of the trade, so to speak. Okay, any questions on the Wilkinson catalyst? So now let's talk about another um, key series of complexes slash catalysts that appeared um, shortly thereafter. So these are the Schrock Osborne Catalyst. And you'll see the publication record here picked up right about when this, um, the, the, the series of papers on the original Wilkinson's catalyst sort of died down, and that's at least in part because Osborne was the student who was doing a lot of this work in Wilkinson's lab, and then he moved to start his own group um, and continued working on, uh, on, on hydrogenation catalysts. Um, 
and, and Dick Schrock was a PhD student with him. And, and so I think one of the remarkable things about Schrock and his career is how many times his name pops up in, in um, different areas of organometallic chemistry. So he's clearly made a massive contribution. And so the general structure of the schrock osborne catalysts, these are cationic ruthenium complexes. There's going to be some diene. This is typically going to be cod or norbornadiene. So I've drawn this just as a general diene here. And then two phosphine ligands. Oh, sorry, rhodium. Cationic with some kind of um, non-coordinating counter ion. So, for example, BF4 minus or BF6 minus. And then two phosphines that, that can be tied together. Um, so, so when, when tied together at that time, the ones that they were looking at um, are most commonly are these DPE derived versions. And so I'm, I'm actually not 100% sure. I, I looked into this, but maybe someone in the audience can correct me. I, I, there, there's a whole family of catalysts that are all called Schrock Osborne catalysts. I'm not sure if there's a single one that is the Schrock Osborne catalyst, but they all um, they all share this this common set of features that I just described. Um, and so, one of the important um, features mechanistically is that the just as we saw in the case of the Wilkinson's catalyst, but not for the exact same reasons, this structure as drawn is not the active catalytically active form. And so, problem of the day number one asks you to propose the active form of the schrock osborne catalyst. And so I'm just going to take the liberty of drawing out the full structure of one of these, just for the purpose of the illustration. So take a look at that. Discuss with your neighbor if you have a question. Okay, what do we think here, Stephen? <laughs> so you can get oxidative addition at the end of the hydrogen, okay. and then you do a migratory insertion and reductive elimination to hydrogenate one of those double bonds. Okay, so rhodium here is rhodium 1, so Stephen's. Um, idea is that first we're going to form um, this sigma complex. This step isn't isn't normally drawn in catalytic cycles just because it's um, it's fast and reversible. 
And then from here, we're going to undergo oxidative addition. I'm using some abbreviations for the ligands here. If anything is um, confusing to anybody, then, then you know, just don't, don't be hesitant to give a shout. Now we're at radian 3. And then you said from here, you're going to have migratory insertion. So, so now we've basically gone through the Olefin mechanism. And so now we're going to have migratory insertion. I'll draw the migratory insertion intermediate just so everyone's on the same page. Reductive elimination. So the product of this will be um, now a, a monoalkene complex. And what would happen next? So you can get coordination from solvent, right? And yeah. then you can hydrogenate again. Uh -huh. Okay, and so after that, um, so we, we do that process again, and then after that, we're left with. So S here is just solvent, and so this is now the active catalyst. And so that was one, one of the points I wanted to make, where it doesn't matter really whether it's cod or nor of one adiene, the, the, the active form of the catalyst ends up being the same. This is just a matter of how quickly it will initiate. So this is the general form, the active form of the schrock osborne family of catalysts. Can you run these reactions in like ether or solvents that typically aren't very good at coordinating? You would need something like THF, right? Yeah, that's a good question. So one of the key um, points is that these, with this family of solvent uh, of catalysts, they typically run in more polar solvents, as you said, like like THF. I think ether. I'd have to look. I think it might be okay, um, but less coordinating things like DCM, for example, can be a problem. So I'll just write out now some um, general features of this family of catalysts, and then we'll jump into a fun problem of the day, which is problem of the number two, which builds on this framework that we just discussed. Um, so some of the empirical trends from the work of, 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 of Schott and Osborne, and then bi the bidentate catalysts. are typically more reactive. Um, so these, one of the important parts of these, cat, the features of these catalysts is that, is that they're cationic. And so if you, uh, prepare and study the corresponding um, neutral forms. They actually give different product distributions. And so one way, after you get this dihydride, one way to go to perturb to the neutral pathway would be if you react with base. The hydrides in this case are, are protic, so they can be deprotonated. Now you have a neutral monohydride. Um, and so if you're in that regime, then you get different product outcomes. And so um, some um, so, so one of the tricks that they did empirically was to uh, run in, in the presence of a small amount. Of, of a H plus source to ensure that you're always on the desired cycle. Mechanistically, these go through olefin mechanisms. And 
then as we said, typically polar solvents. Um, I think that that, that hopefully that reason there is clear. Okay, so let's discuss now this interesting looking problem that connects to this theme. Problem of the day number two, part A. So the backstory here in 2012, this was actually while I was still a PhD student at Oxford, um, Weller and McGregor in a collaborative paper published, so, so Weller is at, uh, at Oxford, they published, um, um, and the first author on this is Seb, Seb, Sebastian Pike, Seb Pike, they published this landmark paper of uh, x-ray crystal structure of uh, um, sigma complex shown. So first, just as a refresher, and to, I think, the part of the reason I want to um, um, discuss this problem is that there are often a lot of hidden intermediates in hydrogenation catalytic cycles, sigma complexes, and, and things of this sort um, that we don't draw because they're formed and, and, and then dissociation taken, takes place very quickly. But they're, they're still sometimes important to think about. Okay, so let's first just go through the oxidation state, the electron count, and overall electron count of this sigma complex. Zichi, what do you think? Rhodium um, 1, D8, 16 electron complex. Okay. And then what happens? Probably just looking at this molecule, you're thinking it's not super stable. So, so how do things change if you were to lose the two sigma interactions? So, if you were to how, if you were to dissociate that ligand? No, I'm just saying, what would happen to these? Let's just say, uh, transiently, you'd make a 12 electron complex, and then you're saying it's going to find its solvent. Okay. okay, good. Okay, now a more tricky proposition. How might you go about making such a complex? I'll just leave this open if anyone wants to jump in. So what's the most obvious thing to try based on the discussion we just had? Hydrogenate norbornadiene. Okay. Um, norbornadiene or norbornadiene. So, um, and then and then what's going to be the problem with that, Tanner? Uh, catalyst is probably going to decompose at the temperature you would want to hydrogenate it. Do it in a cyclohexane or DCM. So the catalyst is going to decompose. Um, you mean the? If I understand what you're getting at, that this intermediate is not going to be stable, so it's just going to do something else. Yeah. So you might get this, but but then or yeah, it might not be composed, but it might do whatever electrophilic degeneration, something. Other other things are going to happen, and so for example, you have solvent. Let's say you're in polar solvent, then polar solvent is likely going to coordinate. 
if you're in nonpolar solvent, then the, the chemistry might not turn on in the first place. Okay. Give yourself considerations. Any other thoughts? I think this is a good, good idea. Okay, so to try to come about it using transfer hydrogenation from isopropanol or something like that. Or what? I mean boring. Okay. Yeah, I think there you have to be... Um, the thing you need to be conscientious of is, is your transfer agent going to have anything Lewis basic because anything Lewis basic is going to coordinate in preference to these CH bonds. Can you force it to go through a hydride mechanism? Okay, that's interesting. So, so make like a rhodium-3. Yeah, so we mentioned, for example, you can make rhodium-3 dihydride with base to make neutral, neutral rhodium monohydride insert, and then you have to find a way to convert that rhodium carbon bond selectively. Yeah, I think these are all creative ideas. So this this is really the whole crux of the, the, the paper and probably why it got into science and why it's so interesting. It's very hard to freeze out these kinds of intermediates unless you play some tricks. And the trick that they play in this case is it's basically what Tanner proposed, but the trick is that they do it on a single crystal. of the pre-catalyst for the, this complex. So they get clean single crystal to single crystal uh, conversion. And, and when locked in the solid state, so this is never in solution, it's only isolated in the solid state. In the solid state, things have special properties because they can really be locked in, especially at low temperature, in, in ways where there's not much um, um, of an opportunity for, for, so, um, for, for dissociation. Um, and, and so it's not it's not always necessarily the first thing you, you, you would try, but I have seen this now a few times in organometallic, um, maybe more than a few, several times, to get really high energy, interesting intermediates to, to go single crystal to single crystal. And sometimes you can even just do these um, in situ while you're taking diffraction, X-ray diffraction, neutron diffraction, then subject a single crystal to an H2 stream, for example. Just tools of the trade to be aware of. Okay, and then the last one, which is maybe an easier one, the structure of the counter anion, um, which is barf sol. It's just a boron for perfluorophenols on it. Perfluorophenols? It's a meta CF3. Meta. Colloquially called BARF. Thank you, Saul and Tanner. And the point is that this is one of the um, archetypal non coordinating counter anions that is also um, a bit greasier in nature. So, some of the other non coordinating counter anions that are still polar in nature, whereas BARF is more lipophilic in nature. Okay, very good. So, let's keep marching forward. early account from Crabtree, which is a really uh, awesome read on this topic and, and, and gives some of the hidden insights behind the discovery. So I'd really recommend checking this out. And it's written in a really accessible way. Um, and so the structure of Crabtree's catalyst 
come here. So hopefully everybody is getting good at drawing uh, cod litters. It's a common theme of today's lecture. So this is also a cationic complex, but now it's cationic iridium. And then one of the differences is we trade a fairly strongly coordinating um, phosphine ligand for a more weakly coordinating purity ligand. And so um, there's a, one of the interesting pieces of, of history behind this discovery, which I think Merritt's brief discussion is that remember that coming out of the Wilkinson system and the Schrock Osborne system, um, most hydrogenations were run in, in polar solvents. And so that was anytime you made a new complex, that was how people typically benchmark new catalysts, is that they ran them in these same polar solvents like THF. And it was it was known that iridium underwent rapid oxidative addition to H2 to make dihydride intermediates, but that then those were unreactive. So that was sort of puzzling. I think now when we think of iridium, we think of it as, as a, one, an expensive metal, but one that has really potent reactivity. But at that time, um, in the early 1970s, people were... Mid-1970s. Mid people... Um, hadn't really used iridium at all for any kind of homogeneous catalysis. And so Crabtree's hypothesis was that while it's undergoing uh, oxidative addition quite readily, maybe the problem is that after that, a, a strongly coordinating ligand, even a solvent molecule, comes in and binds, and, and that complex is unreactive. And so the key insight was to then start moving to more weakly coordinating ligand sets, and then also this serendipitous discovery that, um, that, they, that, that by moving to DCM or um, chloroform, all of a sudden the, the, the reactivity took off. And so the lesson that he makes, that he tries to convey in this review and also in his textbook is that um, it's important when you make a new complex that you don't know how it's going to behave to, to test its behavior widely. And, and there's also this adage that you get what you screen for, and if all you're screening for is you know, catalyst performance in polar solvents, that's what you're going to find. And so, um, I just I think it's it's striking to think that if they had missed that simple um, observation, how how much it would have slowed down the development of the whole field. One of the remarkable things about the Crabtree catalyst is that um, if you just so, right, the catalyst, I think, is a yellow color, if I'm not mistaken. And if you just make a solution of it and bubble in H2, it turns colorless. And after a bit of work, they found that that uh, means it's forming the dihydride complex. Uh, and that this is, is actually stable, so it's a this alkene, in this case, this alkene dihydride complex, and it's stable, and that this is reversible. So if you put vacuum, for example, then you can go back to the yellow parameters. You can just watch this, these color changes. And so, as I said, one of the key findings was that once they moved, so in THF, these catalysts were completely useless. They just crashed out and did nothing. But as soon as you moved to DCM or chloroform, now the reaction, the catalyst was super reactive. The most reactive homogeneous catalyst that had been reported at that time and still one of the most uh, that's been disclosed to date. And 
where I think this is, is very clear is looking at the reactivity with highly substitute alkenes, high substitute alkenes, tetra substitute alkenes. So in one of the handouts that you had today, it shows the comparative rates for different alkenes with Wilkinson's catalyst, Schock Osborne family catalyst, and Crabtree's catalyst. And this catalyst just far and away blows out the competition uh, for hydrogenation of, of tetra substituted alkenes. <coughs> Mechanistically, it's a little bit more complex. I think I won't, just in the interest of time, I won't go into um, all the details. So from, from this experiment, it's evident, it can be evident to you that a olefin pathway is, is competent, or at least that elementary step is viable. But whether that's going on in, in, in catalysis under catalytic conditions is, is a subject of, of, of debate. And so in this review, Crabtree basically says that with both the hydride, there's, there's evidence that um, both hydride and olefin pathways, in terms of the elementary steps, be potentially competent. Um, and he favors he, he favors under catalytic conditions a hydride pathway, at least in that in that. And then in some more recent studies there's there's evidence for more complex redox behavior as well. So classically we would draw this as a, a iridium one three couple, um, but there's been some evidence to suggest that instead it could be a uh, iridium three iridium five couple, um, and in this case, it, it could potentially involve um, a polyhydride type of intermediate. And so, one of the powerful applications of Crabtree's catalyst that's near and dear to my heart, it takes advantage of the fact that it has incredible reactivity, but also that's cationic and can thus coordinate. It's particularly in in um, um, low dielectric constant solvent media to polar functional groups. And so it's, it's been widely used in directed hydrogenations. I'll just give provide one example here. Um, where this tetra substituted alkene be hydrogenated to give a single diastereomer and the key point is that a lone pair is of the carbonyl can, can serve as a docking site for the iridium uh, hydride intermediate. And, and, and this topic um, has been reviewed a couple times, but one of the early reviews is by my former PhD supervisor, John Brown, co-supervisor. Almost 30 years old now, but still a really great read. Um, and he, he covers all of the examples of directed hydrogenation, that it, or representative examples of direct hydrogenation that appeared in the literature at that time. So again, in terms of synthetic planning, if you're thinking about integrating a, a, a sequence where you do like a stereoselective reduction to make a secondary alcohol, and then you want to use that to do a diastereoselective hydrogenation, um, Crabtree's catalyst is, is a good, good choice, first thing to, to try. Okay, so let me clear 
off the board. So now it's still on the topic of Crabtree's Catalyst. One of the things that might be intuitively obvious if you're thinking about this, or, or that if it's not, it probably if you, if you stopped and thought about it for a minute, would, would come to your mind, is that um, part of the power of Crabtree's Catalyst is that the ligand set overall is, is weakly coordinating, um, and that is gives rise to its impressive kinetic reactivity. But you might also expect then that the catalyst might not be that stable and might be susceptible to some decomposition pathways. And indeed, um, that's the case. And so let me just show you some of the complexes that can arise from decomposition. So the basic idea is that these uh, dihydride uh, intermediates that, that you produce, um, if, if they can't find um, an alkene or some other um, reaction partner, then they're going to um, oligomerize or, or dimerize. And so indeed, that is what's observed. So this is actually a, a model system of Crabtree's catalyst. We're using the same ligand, like 2-phosphine ligand, for example, there. And then the actual Crabtree's catalyst itself, it has a phosphine and a pyridine. Um, so denoting that here as L and L prime. That one also forms a polyhydride bridged, uh, uh, bridged hydride species, but its structure is just a little bit different and arguably even more exotic. Cool. So here, uh, now we're going to shift gears a little bit. And so I think the three catalysts I just mentioned synthetically are, 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 are some of the, the go-tos, go at least in, 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 in the realm of uh, racemic reactions. But mechanistically, there are 
other types of systems that are worth discussing because they illustrate uh, key principles from the class. And so this one, Stephen just alluded to, which is catalysts that can react via monohydride rather than dihydride. And this will set us up for um, problem of the day number three. So here's one such example. Also from the Wilkinson group, rhodium monohydride CO So this is also a competent catalyst for hydrogenation, but, but the reactivity is a little bit more idiosyncratic. It really only works well for terminal alkenes. And so problem of the day number three <coughs> asks you to ponder the mechanistic origins of this phenomenon. So as we saw, the classical Wilkinson's catalyst is reactive with disubstituted alkenes and terminal alkenes. In this case, um, this monohydride version is only reactive with terminals. And it does other things. One that you might expect is hydroformylation. Okay, it does that. And it is also an isomerization catalyst where internal aliphatic alkenes, terminal aliphatic alkenes can be isomerized inward. Okay, so take a look at problem of the day number three, which asks you to compare and contrast the reactivity of Wilkinson's catalyst and this CO monohydride catalyst. Okay, let's first, let's consider mechanistically what's going on here. So, Schwang, can you help us with this? So here's our pre-catalyst. I got you started by um, dissociating a phosphine ligand, which empirically they find is, is most likely the operative pathway. So we lose, um, we lose a phos triphenyl phosphine. We just abbreviate that here as L. Now we have the um, coordinatively unsaturated version of the monohydride. And what's going to happen next? Uh, 
Okay, so there are two potential things that could happen here. Okay, maybe there are three possible things that happen. Okay, because so 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 one thing that this could do is to react with H2. I think that's the first thing you mentioned to make a trihydride. I think if you go down that route, you're going to find that you will get to something that's coordinatively saturated, and you're going to have to lose CO or lose another phosphine or lose a pretty strong ligand. And what's the other possibility? Coordinate with alkene. OK, coordinate the alkene. And then what might happen? So I'll just draw that out here. OK, so what can happen from there? Um, so either, I'm not sure whether the CO or microstrips. Yeah, so that's a, it's a little tricky because I mentioned that this could be a hydroformylation catalyst, but let's just say for the purposes of this problem, the CO is going to be a spectator ligand. Uh, Insertion. To make a rhodium alkyl. And now, okay, so now you're going to oxidatively add to make high hydrogen complex. So mechanistically, that looks like a plausible pathway. And then now, based on that, Vincent, how might you rationalize the observed chemoselectivity? You're thinking there. What do you mean, sterics? I guess Wilkinson's catalyst. Uh, uh, doesn't have, has fewer ligands on it throughout the catalytic cycle, like, but this one is consistently uh, uh, five or four or five more ligands. As I if you were to form. Yeah, I like your explanation here. I think you're on the right track. Can you want three? Well, two things. First is, if you look at the bottom intermediate, if that's a secondary or tertiary alkyl rhodium species, it won't be stable enough to do the oxidative addition to hydrogen. So you're just going to funnel back to your starting material faster than you can oxidatively add to hydrogen and reductively eliminate. And also the CO, especially if it's trans, makes the hydride, I guess, less likely to insert into an alkene, attenuates the insert, yeah. Okay, so yeah, so I think, so I think. those two things are both working against it. Tanner and Vincent combined explanation, I think, makes sense. So, you know, one of the differences in this pathway versus what you saw before is before is when you made alkyl rhodium, you already have hydride on the metal center. So the fastest, the lowest energy thing that can happen is, is CH recombination. Now, after that migratory insertion, you, you have an intermediate that, for productive catalysis to happen, needs to undergo oxidative addition with H2. That's a, that, that, you know, that's not necessarily a, a, a trivial step. And, and so this process, of course, is reversible. And when you have a secondary group here, then it's probably going to lie here and not do productive chemistry. I think Tanner also alluded to this other aspect of the question, which is that this is an isomerization catalyst. And so one thing that can happen is 
if you undergo um, hydrometallation with this selectivity, then then you have an open then, then you have a beta hydrogen atom, and now because you have the CO bound, the metal in general is more electrophilic and more likely to form that agostic interaction. So that can be a pathway towards the isomerization. So some subtle, subtle differences here that have a fairly profound effect on mechanism. Yeah. If it can isomerize, is that usually what happens? Like, will it's not hydrogenate alkenes? Or will it I, I think faster? I'd have to double check. I, my understanding is that the optimal conditions for hydrogenation and isomerization are, are different. And so I think when you do have positive H2 pressure, that, that hydrogenation is, is the preferred pathway. So Yeah, that's a good proposal. So this, um, I think your idea here, if I understand you correctly, is that you can go directly here if you invoke, and this has also been proposed. You know, from, from my taste, I probably wouldn't call this sigma bomb metathesis just because I think sigma bomb metathesis refers specifically to D0 metal situations, but let's just call this a concerted pathway, where essentially, if I understand what you're saying, this metal alkyl is going to gain a H atom simultaneously with regenerating this active species in a uh, four-centered transition state. So they proposed this, but ultimately thought this uh, thought the data was more consistent with this pathway. They considered this as well. Is this what you had in mind? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Great question. Okay. So now I'm going to. This still falls under the umbrella of catalysts that have a monohydride intermediate, but now I'm going to show you um, a case where that monohydride is going to uh, be used in carbonyl production. I'm just using this PP nomenclature to refer to a bidentate ligand. Just in the interest of time, I won't draw out the geometries here. I just draw the cycle to um, give you a sense of this. And, and I'm also just abbreviating S as solvent. So the substrate in question here is a 1,3-dicarbonyl. One of the key themes that you see in a lot of the early um, asymmetric hydrogenations is that they are directed reactions. They take advantage of pre-association of one or more Lewis basic functional groups on the starting material. And that really helps to minimize the conformational degrees of freedom in the key and anti-determining transition state. I think there are, and now, of course, there are hydrogenations systems that work with almost every alkene you can imagine and, and rely on um, more subtle non-covalent interactions, but at least in the early stages, these types of uh, directed systems were really important.
So, so yeah, one of the things that you would have covered, touched on a little bit in the problem set is that the nature of metal hydride uh, can vary quite a bit depending on the metal and oxidation state and the coordination environment. And so they can be um, basically more or less polar, more, more protic or more hydritic uh, in, in the extreme forms. Um, and so um, with the right coordination environment, they can actually, the, the metal hydrides, like um, mono metal hydrides, that, like I've shown here, can be potent um, one, two reduction reagents as well. And so that's what I've shown here. You get association of the one, three dicarbonyl, and that situates it for hydride transfer. Uh, of course, if the PP, uh, the, the bisphosphine here is chiral, then you have an angle for stereo induction. Um, and then um, after uh, protonation, ligand exchange, um, and then oxidative addition followed by um, base-mediated pro uh, deprotonation of a dihydride to make monohydride, you can regenerate the catalytically active um, species. And so there are many different ways to sort of mix and match these fundamental elementary steps um, to, to, to get to different processes that all um, accomplish a similar overall transformation, but on different functional groups or with different selectivity. And in the interest of time, because I do want to leave a little bit of... of um, few minutes to, to talk about um, asymmetric. I'll just highlight that there are other um, rather mechanistically distinct catalysts that can mediate hydrogenation. So in this department, one that um, I'm sure people are aware of are, are radical type hydrogen atom transfer pathways um, with um, lanthanides, which are D0, lanthanosines specifically, it's known that these two can mediate hydrogenation, but because there are no D, D electrons, These systems simply cannot undergo oxidative addition. There's no electrons on the metal to backbond into the sigma star antibonding orbital. And so here, it is enforced to go through a pathway that looks like this three center, sorry, four center transition state. And this pathway is referred to signal autopsis. We'll also maybe see this in the CH activation lecture. But um, at least in its original definition, sigma bomb metathesis refers specifically to this D0 metal situation. Is there an example of lanthanides using like higher energy orbitals to do reactivity? Uh, you know what I'm I, I do know what you mean. So basically, like doing some redox chemistry yeah. at a, lan a lanthanide. Um, I guess one of the questions would be, yeah. are you going to get right. electron transfer at the metal or at the ligand under those the conditions that you're imagining? So I wouldn't, I, it's probably out there. And then hydrogenation can also be done um, bimetallically. In this case, I've drawn heterobimetallically. If you're interested in that, you can check out this. Nice paper from the Omancad's group. And the key point here is that you can have transition states that look like this for HH cleavage. And make two distinct metal hydrides, one that is protic and one that's hydritic, or 
uh, or that have different properties from one another at the, the least. So another important category that are, are of high synthetic value are outer sphere pathways. These are most commonly seen in situations uh, where you're doing 1-2 reduction of, of carbonyls or, or imines. And synthetically, the most uh, prominent class of, of reaction of this type are the Noyori transfer hydrogenation systems. And so let me just put up a general depiction One of the first um, catalysts of this, this type to, to engage in outer sphere hydrogenation is the Schwo catalyst, some of you may have heard of. If I have time, I can draw it, or if anyone's interested. That then became very um, powerful as a racemization catalyst used by Beckfall and others. But the key point now is that most of the Exciting stuff is happening um, away from the metal center itself, and the metal is really serving as like redox active scaffolding for these key steps. So you'll hear this nomenclature again and again as you work in catalysis, inner sphere, outer sphere. Inner sphere refers to processes that actually directly change the ligand environment around the metal and involving new metal ligand bonds. And outer sphere refers to the opposite of that, but it's simply And then this is really the key key point. I drew that cycle up um, really to just set up this key transition state structure. So the key point here is that you can get this concerted delivery of, of two hydrogen atoms across the alkene, and that this is, so the step I've drawn here is going from here to here. So you can think of these. Um, So I hope, hopefully it's obvious this is a very different sort of um, transition state situation than, than, than the other examples that we've covered. Um, and, and as I said, this is most commonly 
observed with with um, carbonyls or, or amines. And then just in the last couple minutes, I'll uh, provide a little bit of discussion on asymmetric. I'm not going to do this justice because of the timing. Um, but I did provide a handout I hope from the handout you can get a little bit of a sense of the chronology and, and sort of the evolution of the thinking here. And so, um, almost immediately upon publication of Wilkinson's Catalyst, um, that first series of papers, people were interested in rendering the reaction asymmetric. Um, so Knowles was one of the early people who focused on chiral at P um, ligands. The advantage of those is, disadvantage of those is they're not that easy to make, especially in a modular way. And so they had some preliminary results, but it wasn't too convincing. And then, if you think about the timing, um, then in the early 1970s, um, the results from Schrock, Osborne, Schrock and Osborne were published, and people realized that bidentate phosphines are, are, are more reactive in those um, catalysts. And so the, the natural question was to ask, okay, what if we have a chiral um, bidentate ligand? the first one to work reasonably well in, in, in that. So, so then, yeah, Kagan published the first one to work um, to establish that concept of the C2 backbone. And then Knowles came with his dipamp structure, which is chiral at P, but also C2 symmetric. His work really well. This was the, the, the one that was used commercially um, in Monsanto synthesis of Aldopa. This is also the system, probably many of you have heard of, of this paper alluded to. I'm not sure how many people will have actually read it, but it's, a, it's worth reading. Halpern's classic mechanistic study showing that the dipamp system and others in this shock osmond family of catalysts are under curtain hammock control, so that the migratory insertion is fast and reversible, and that stereoselectivity is determined in the CH reductive elimination step. Or oh, sorry, let me, I think I, I said that wrong. So that alkene coordination is fast and reversible, and that subsequent oxidative addition to H2 is the stereo determining step. So I should read that paper well, for sure. Be on the 100% problem. Well, you can you can not read it too. Yes, yeah. <laughs> if you want. That's an also not. And then in um, quite a bit later, but I think the impact um, of this structure really needs no introduction. Noyori's um, axially chiral backbone binap came on the scene, and this really changed the game. Broadly useful. Um, one of the things is that it's um, provides a really defined 
um, substrate binding pocket compared to some of these other structures that you can, you can just tell looking at them are more conformationally um, flexible. And so I mentioned um, Knowles, who was working at Monsanto. I'll just show it very quickly. Both of these two discoveries, and I think part of why the inventors there um, were awarded the Nobel Prize, has had immediate, immediate impact industrially. In the case of Knowles's work, it was on the synthesis of this compound called NOPA. Um, where the key step is a directed hydrogenation of this dehydro alpha amino acid. And then in Noyori's case, um, Takasago used this for, probably you covered this in classics, the synthesis of menthol. Um, that's, that synthesis is, is a classic. Um, I, and one of the handouts, you have that route. I'll just, in the interest of time, I'll just show you a, a um, another example from Noyori and from Takasago that basically makes the same point, but it's easier to draw. So the menthol synthesis is not an actual hydrogenation, but rather an isomerization, same, same idea, though. And, and they were able to make a range of different scents and flavoring agents using the same, same approach of directed asymmetric hydrogenation. OK, that concludes today's class. Happy to answer any questions. Anybody wants to follow up on anything. And as a reminder, we have class on Friday. So the day after tomorrow. And then we don't have class on the following Monday. So one week from today is the midterm. Okay. Everybody clear on that? Thank you. The review session is also Friday.